Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today, Lauren Faber O'Connor, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Uh, in that role, she is responsible for implementing uh, LA's Green New Deal. Before that, she was the political director of the Environmental Defense Fund's West Coast office. Before that, uh, uh, the, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Climate Change Programs at Cal EPA. Before that, a senior advisory uh, policy advisor to the British Embassy in Washington, DC. Before that, she was a master's student at, in, at Columbia in climate and society. And before that, and most pleasingly uh, and uh, emotionally rewarding to me, she was actually a bachelor student here, like many of you in Earth Systems and Economics a little while ago. Uh, so with that introduction, Laura's going to tell us how she's been able to actually be implementing a new, a new Green Deal, whereas everybody else in the world seems to be discussing and arguing such things. And I'm here to tell you she's just the person to do it. So Laura, take it away. Thank you, John, so much. Um, it means a lot to me to be here as well. Uh, you can pull up my, my slides here. Thank you. It, as I said, it, it means a ton for me to be a part of this seminar and to be doing anything I can to be working more closely with you. John is an absolute um, local, state, national, international leader in uh, clean energy. And I've learned such a great ton from you. Um, and I've tried to apply those learnings everywhere I go. So you continue to be a really important mentor to me. Um, and so take heart, take note, everyone who you know, is, is able to take his class or be part of um, any of the, the institutes that, that John leads as well. Um, as he mentioned, I am Mayor Garcetti's Chief Sustainability Officer, so I'm down here in Los Angeles. Um, I'm a native Angelina, but actually never really pictured myself uh, living here after I grew up and went off to college uh, to Stanford. And so spent my career, as John said, in other places, other parts of, of the country. Um, and really only over the last kind of few years before I joined the Garcetti administration back in 2015, was I seeing the kind of change um, that I, I just was so uh, enthralled to see in a place like Los Angeles, the second largest city in the country. Um, and I think what I would also just say over the course of my career, is that I've really come to realize local, local action at the city level is truly one of the most impactful places um, to make a difference on climate change and, and to really push climate action. And so uh, that has been a, a lesson learned. I, I came out of college or grad school thinking I've got to work at the international scale um, in order to really make a dent in the climate crisis. And I think with with each professional move, I've gotten closer and closer to home, literally and figuratively, moving into local government. And it's not to say that any of those other places aren't places to make an extraordinary amount of difference, but cities really are on the front lines of climate action. And that is because we are the front lines of everything you feel from the climate crisis, whether that is the negative impacts or the economic opportunities and public health opportunities that come along with strong action to combat climate change. And so we, we like to talk about in the mayor, as you can see in this picture, you know, feel that nobody is doing more on climate change than cities, but actually at the same time, nobody is doing enough. Um, and cities really are where you can pull such unique levers on climate policy across all different sectors that have a huge bearing on our greenhouse gas profile, whether that's um, whether that's urban planning and which determines really how far you drive to get from work to home. Um, that determines exactly the, the patterns of our urban centers to building codes um, and so many other facets that really are at the, the jurisdiction of the city level. Um, that have great consequence when it comes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. And so for example, just in, and you can just start popping through these. Um, they'll just kind of, you can just click, click, click through them. But the city is doing a ton of work just to, to really have a global influence. And 
you know, we are, we have the LA's Green New Deal, which I'll talk more about. I think there's one more you can pull there. Um, LA's Green New Deal is really about creating a global model for what it means to take local action to uphold the Paris Climate Agreement. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, but again, when you have the second largest city in America, we really do participate on the global stage. And so what we do in a city like LA matters because it helps above and below when it comes to smaller cities, bigger cities, what can be happening at the state level and beyond. And, and one thing, you know, just in terms of where we are kind of politically in the policy world, I think what we've seen is that previous administrations and an incoming administration who are really dedicated to climate action have recognized the role of state and local governments in, in really pushing that action and, and understanding that the role of the federal government can, the role the federal government can play to really help reinforce and help empower state and local governments to take that meaningful action. When Mayor Garcetti released LA's Green New Deal in April of last year, April 2019, um, we started out by it really when we were developing it as, you know, kind of the next stage of the sustainable city plan that Mayor Garcetti released in 2015, which was the first time the city of LA ever had a sustainable city plan. And when he put that in place in 2015, he said, every four years, we're going to update the plan. And so when I joined, I joined right after the plan was released in 2015. And four years felt this, this you know, plan update felt very far away. And I can't tell you how quickly it came upon us when here we were in 2017, 2018 going, we've got to embark on a process, you know, a really um, in-depth, comprehensive public process in quantitative analytical process to figure out you know, what the new incarnation is of the sustainable city plan. Because what I think was really prescient of the mayor and thinking about that four-year increment was not just that he wanted to make sure that he had an updated plan within his, his term in office to demonstrate that he is always looking to, um, to increase our ambition and our goals. But it was absolutely a mandate that we do that because even though in 2015, what we released was some of the most far reaching goals and targets on the books, um, just four years later, some of those things were considered conventional wisdom, we've achieved our goals, and we really had to go further faster. The science was significantly more dire um, coming out of some of the IPCC um, reports and sort of the 2018 and 2019 timeframe, as you all know. And the technology uh, across the energy space and, and water and waste have all improved at exponential pace. And so our ability to think more expansively in terms of solutions and pace of um, our goals had really opened up. And also what had changed was that uh, our, our president had said that we were pulling out of the Paris Agreement and, and Mayor Garcetti was really at the forefront of saying that was not gonna stand and that we were going to uphold the Paris Climate Agreement. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the efforts that we've done under, under that scenario, but really we wanted to say, what does that look like? So we undertook a really uh, comprehensive quantitative analysis of what our greenhouse gas budget would be for the city between now and 2050. So for so many reasons, we had to dramatically update the sustainable city plan to meet the ambition and the opportunity of the moment. Next slide. What the Green New Deal is uh, grounded in, and this is exactly as John put, you know we saw all this argument around the country and beyond or what is a green new deal what is a green new deal and we just thought let's put this to bed um, we're going to describe we're going to show we're going to model what a green new deal is and its key principles for us are really this commitment and recognition of the urgency of this problem and the ambition that we have to with which we have to approach this crisis and that when we approach this crisis, we have to make sure that environmental justice and equity is foundational, is key and core to how we develop our plan and how we implement our plan. And then at the same time, 
we're, we're safeguarding our economy and making sure that we're creating an inclusive economy that is, is open to anyone and everyone and is making sure that workers who are currently in fossil fuel industries that we are of course looking to ramp down, that they have a place in the green economy as well. And that as government, we have to do everything in our power through our budgets, through our resources, through our personnel, through our buying power uh, to, to walk the walk, to model that behavior, to implement solutions and um, at an even more accelerated pace so that we are serving as that local model. Next slide. Just to give you a flavor, um, you can go to plan.lamayor.org to actually read LA's Green New Deal and, and learn more about it. But this just gives you a sense of how comprehensive and wide ranging the Green New Deal is in LA. And right at the outset, environmental justice is number one on the docket. Um, it was a really interesting um, kind of process as we were going through a stakeholder engagement process to determine what kinds of goals and programs we wanted to highlight and focus on across all these key areas. We wanted to make sure that environmental justice and equity shows up in all of these topic areas, but we also wanted to make sure that it was brought forward as its own key principle and key set of goals. So we did just that. We, we both wove equity throughout all of the chapters and demonstrated at the very top of the plan, that it was a, a top priority to make sure that the, the policies, the programs, the goals that we're setting are with the eye toward environmental justice and making sure that the communities that have been most impacted by environmental harm um, are the ones that we're focusing on to improve their health, and their access uh, to you know, improved, improved amenities, improved lives and improved services. I think, um, this is one of our kind of favorite ways of boiling down what it means to really hit carbon neutrality and hit on the key sectors is LA's five zeros. So this is a zero carbon grid, zero carbon buildings, zero carbon transportation, zero waste and zero wasted water. And you know those are foundational pieces to foundational sets of actions um, to the overall uh, Green New Deal. And so what's particularly interesting here is that Los Angeles owns and operates its own municipal utility. It is the largest municipal utility in the country. And it's not just the largest municipal utility in the country. For those of you that are studying the power sector and utility regulation and utility uh, business models, you'll understand when I say it's a vertically integrated utility, which means which is rare in California, uh, but it means that, that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power runs all of its generation. So we're used to utilities in California just delivering power. And what happens behind the delivery of power, the transmission of that electricity, the generation of that electricity, that comes from all different sources. The, um, the operation of the grid, the balancing of the grid, that comes from different sources. But with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the municipally owned utility of the city of Los Angeles, we do all of that. So when it comes to procuring and operating uh, energy itself, energy generation itself, or actually operating and balancing the grid so that you know we basically have supply and demand matched at all times, uh, that is also the responsibility of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. So when, when a city like Los Angeles says we're hitting 100% renewable energy, it is different than some other cities that say things that say that, and they do that through often buying green tags, you know, demanding kind of renewable electricity being, being serviced into their system. Whereas we are actually not just for our municipal um, our municipal electricity demand, but for the entire city, the 4 million residents of the city of Los Angeles are actually developing the renewable generation that is needed to support the grid to then deliver that electricity to Angelinos. So it really is quite a feat when we talk about 100% renewable energy uh, for LA. And then similarly, um, on zero carbon buildings, zero carbon transportation, uh, take transportation for for example, and I'll come on to both the, the grid and transportation in a minute, but we're talking everything from light duty vehicles to medium 
you know, medium heavy duty buses, obviously, you know, the, uh, we have some of the largest bus fleets across the county um, as the county of Los Angeles. And we own and operate the Port of Los Angeles, which is the busiest port complex in the country, in the Western Hemisphere, I should say. And there's a ton, there are there's about 10,000 uh, heavy duty diesel trucks that operate at the port on a daily basis. And it is uh, an incredible amount of infrastructure to have to transform. And I'll come onto that in, in a little bit as well. So next slide, um, when I, I talk about what does it mean to hit carbon neutrality, we did do a, a clear carbon budget. And so this, this graph, this graphic is actually specifically LA City's carbon budget. And uh, that means if you look at these, these different slices, building energy use, we expect to be able to get down to an absolute zero. Um, and that means building decarbonization, which is an example of this importance of moving, of a review of our plan every four years, because building decarbonization, which means getting uh, carbon out of our buildings, which is removing the use of fossil fuels to power our buildings, uh, was not really something people were thinking or talking about in 2015. And it wasn't because it was just this far off idea. It was just that Everyone was talking about uh, you know, energy efficiency and, and things along those lines, but the, the scope of the policy discussion in climate change progresses so quickly that, that building decarbonization now is, is fundamental and foundational. And as the grid continues to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and towards zero carbon, what's left of those buildings is the use of natural gas in buildings. And that's a key area that we have to focus on is reducing the use of natural gas um, in our buildings. And we want to do that for a number of reasons. Of course, it's carbon intensive. So we know that it contributes to extremely unhealthful indoor air quality when we are burning a fossil fuel inside our buildings. And if the level of, of, um, of pollution uh, that exists inside our buildings uh, because of burning of fossil fuels, if that level existed outdoors where ambient air quality is actually regulated, indoor air quality is not regulated, but ambient outdoor air quality is regulated, it would far um, exceed the allowable limits. And so, so building health, healthy buildings is an extraordinarily important part of our plan. Um, and we expect that we, be, we, we need to be able to essentially electrify our buildings or deploy um, other forms of, of uh, fuels like hydrogen fuel down the line in order to, to reach zero carbon buildings. And then there's transportation, um, which, which our on-road uh, transportation, we do expect to hit zero emissions. So, so cars, trucks, buses on the road, we do expect to be able to get all the way down to zero emission. But the city of Los Angeles, as I mentioned, runs the port of Los Angeles, its own, um, it's a proprietary department, as is the airport, LAX, um, which is the third busiest airport in the country, and, I'm sorry, in the world. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, what we don't necessarily have control over are aviation fuels, and that's an area that um, requires a significant amount well is, is fuels within shipping and fuels within aviation and that's why you still see a little bit at the end in 2050 and then industrial emissions there's quite um, heavy, a lot of heavy industry in LA where we're going to have to look at how we uh, you know get all the way down to zero to hit neutrality in 2050 if if solutions don't come to bear between now and then but there's a ton of work that you can that we need to do and one of the thing I want to point out with this graphic is you see much steeper lines in the early years. Basically, between now and 2025, you see significantly steeper lines. And that is because of our intention of upholding the urgency of this crisis, which means that the emissions that we emit now are the ones that really matter. We can't kind of go crazy now and then in 2040 really start taking this seriously because the damage will be done, the atmosphere will have been polluted. Um, and so we, we know that we absolutely have to take as much focus and acceleration in the near term. And that's a really important signal that we're sending globally. And when we do this, we also know that there are significant health benefits, um, that we're saving lives, over 1600 lives a year, 
by 2050, just, just out of the air pollution um, improvements that can be made, the air quality improvements that can be made from a lot of these um, interventions. And then the associated uh, cost savings and economic savings that come with reduced um, bad health outcomes. And then an incredible opportunity around job creation, job creation in building retrofits, job creations in um, modernizing our grid and building out the grid infrastructure that is needed to support renewables, the job opportunities in building out a, an EV electric vehicle charging network, um, as well as the, the, the vehicles themselves, but that infrastructure is such a huge opportunity. And just one note on how we actually use this, um, this plan internally. We, it is absolutely an organizing and accountability tool uh, for all of the departments across the city. So this isn't just something that our utility, you know, that DWP is responsible for, or our Department of Transportation, or Sanitation, or our Buildings Department. This is something that is shared across our, you know, our um, uh, engineering department, our libraries, our zoo, our, um, you know, internal general services department, every 35 city departments are involved in delivering on these priorities, the port, the airport, the police department, the fire department, everyone has a departmental chief sustainability officer that is sort of my dotted line of, you know, my army throughout the city, working on sustainability initiatives and progressing our, uh, our goals. And so it's a really effective uh, coordinating tool and a really effective management tool for the mayor. I wanna come on to, just checking my time here, I wanna come on to quickly a couple of um, deep dives in a, in a few areas. And I mentioned the role of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. A couple of years ago, we embarked on um, what really is considered the most comprehensive, in-depth, uh, wide-ranging analysis and modeling um, exercise to really chart out our course to 100% renewable energy. And we are doing that with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is one of the national labs under the Department of Energy. And it has been an incredible uh, partnership that includes a significant amount of public engagement and a, an actual 100% um, renew, uh, renewable energy advisory group that has been with us, working with us for the last two years to help inform the analysis, respond to the analysis. And this just this isn't just about how to address hitting our renewable energy goals, just flipping out what we have in natural gas generation to renewables. But this is taking into account building decarbonization and its impact on the grid, EV, you know, electrification of transportation and its impact on the grid. It's looking at job impacts. It's looking at air quality impacts. It's really providing, and that's why I say it's one of the most comprehensive, it's really providing this entire holistic look. And again, how are we balancing the grid? How are we making sure that supply and demand are met at mm -hmm. all times? Um, and this has been an extraordinary, extraordinary effort that will be culminating in the next few months, which is ex exciting. And then we'll be sort of embarking on a much broader um, outreach and engagement on the final results. On mobility, um, this is an area that, you know, folks might not think of Los Angeles as, um, you know, super innovative when it comes to clean transportation. People think of us as the car capital of the world. And I think of us as really the transportation innovator of the world because, you know, we have constantly over a century and a half been remaking our transportation system. Some for the better than the worse when it comes to, you know, the, the massive buildup of our freeway system and the sprawl that had ensued. However, here we are saying we're going to remake ourselves again. And that's through the build out of 15 rail lines through the largest public infrastructure investment project in US history for public transit, transit in the city of Los Angeles to really focusing on people-centered streets. Streets are a city's most precious collateral. It is an incredible public space that we are, we are dedicating to parked cars often more than anything else. And so how are we reimagining and engaging Angelinos Run what that could really 
how that could really transform. And I will tell you, we'll talk about this in a sec, our response to COVID-19 is beginning to address some of this. This demand for more uh, public space for people um, has really started to re-engage people around this particular concept. And then finally, I wanted to just come on to also in the world of transportation, next slide, the Port of Los Angeles, which really is um, unfortunately one of the most polluted parts of the country because of the influx of, of very dirty ships coming in from all over the world and some of the you know heaviest, dirtiest diesel trucks coming in every direction of freeways all around communities in the San Pedro Bay area. Um, it is also one of the most important economic centers in Los Angeles, in the region, and in the country. One in 54 jobs in America are connected to the Port of Los Angeles. So it is an incredibly important economic center, but we have a huge responsibility to make it the most efficient and the cleanest possible. And so in 2017, Mayor Garcetti committed, set a goal uh, for the port to have a completely zero emission drayage, which means the, the, the sort of delivery trucks coming in and out of the semis, these big trucks coming out in and out of the port to be zero emission by 2035. And this is the 10,000 trucks I was talking about. And the on-dock equipment, the cargo handling equipment uh, to be zero emission by 2030. This has sent waves around the world really for innovation. Um, really, this is the only port complex in the country that is thinking this way. And we're, we're using our international platforms to also bring in additional ports to work with us because you know, there's so much that this kind of trade connected, um, uh, you know, type of work can do if, if we can collaborate. So happy to engage more on that topic if anyone's interested. But on the topic of collaboration outside of our borders, next slide. There's two associations really that I want to um, highlight. One is Climate Mayors. Climate Mayors is a network of now 468 mayors, American mayors, in 48 out of 50 states. Uh, together, that represents 74 million Americans. And Climate Mayors was actually created by, co-founded by Mayor Garcetti back in 2014. Uh, this was under the Obama era where mayors, um, and this was a dozen or so mayors, came together and said, we're all you know, working on climate change, working on greenhouse gas emission reductions. And we think that we can probably learn from each other and, and, and at really the peer-to-peer -peer mayoral level. We wanna do that, but we also really want to make sure that, that DC is listening to us, that, that they know that this is very important to us and that we wanna see, this is pre, you know, prior to Paris, we wanna see really ambitious outcomes at the federal level and at the international level. And that's really what Climate Mayors was founded on. But I will say that when President Trump said that we were uh, going to pull the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement, um, you know, Climate Mayors really said enough is enough. And within a day, the at that point in 2018, uh, was that it? Uh, you know, at that point, 2017, um, Climate mayors was at about 60 mayors strong. Um, overnight, after that happened, climate mayors doubled in membership and then tripled and quadrupled within the week. Um, it has since been, as I said, 468 mayors. And that is because there was a kind of zero tolerance for any sort of message or impression that America is not focused on and taking climate change seriously. And that we see the significant threat to our residents, to our economies, and the opportunity that exists when we actually tackle this issue. And so Climate Mayors has grown and has grown in its ambition, has in its reach. And we're not only using our bully pulpit um, to really push back when something kind of negative comes forward as a rollback out of DC, or when we want to uh, support and underscore uh, some great things that are happening in states and cities around the world or at the international level, but also taking on unprecedented levels of, of um, 
collective action, which is really exciting. And, and one example is the Climate Nares EV Purchasing Collaborative. Now, what we saw as Climate Mares was a situation where a city like Los Angeles could command a price and access to EVs for our fleet um, that was pretty competitive and you know, most vehicle types are available to us in a big city. But our colleagues in say, a Knoxville, Tennessee did not have the same access to vehicle types and to pricing, which we thought was not right and we thought was unhelpful to our overall goals. And so we thought, well, what if we can combine our purchasing power to really command both equal access and, and, and competitive pricing um, for our cities? And we set out to develop this one-stop shop platform ca now called the EV Purchasing Collaborative that does just that. And so you can go to driveevfleets.org and you can check it out. Um, and it really has enabled uh, thousands of, of new purchases of vehicles. We've now added transit buses and electric school buses to the platform. So now we have hundreds of cities participating and thousands of, of EVs on order or purchased, as well as charging infrastructure through this platform, which really skips over a bunch of process um, at the city level and just says, here is a contract that you can just go right into. It's used a competitive process and car companies understand that they want to be listed on this collaborative because of the access that it, it lends itself to so many different markets across the country. So that's been a really exciting um, development of collective action at the city level. But we've also been really forthright about the need for a green and, and equitable recovery uh, from COVID-19. And that, and, and recently wrote a letter to Congress to that effect, that you know, we are in a, a moment of extreme crisis on so many levels, and that everything we do to build ourselves back, to build ourselves forward, has to take climate change into account. And I can come on to that a little in a little bit as well. Next slide. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Um, the other really important collaboration that a city like Los Angeles is a part of is C40 cities. It's a, another, uh, it's a, probably the most climate, the most important and effective climate leadership group out there, period. Um, and Mayor Garcetti has been a member, Los Angeles has been a member for many, many years and Mayor Garcetti in the steering committee leadership for many years and seeing how effective uh, C40 can be at leveraging the members, which are the 97, you know, 97 of the world's largest cities. So from every region of the world. Uh, these mega cities, what they can do in terms of economies of scale, in terms of you know, being laboratories for change and really testing and demonstrating new types of solutions and the learnings from each other, incredible focus on the learnings from each other. He was extraordinary, he's extraordinarily dedicated to this organization and was voted uh, a year ago to be the chair, voted in by his peers to be the chair of it. And it is, I will tell you, not a um, ceremonial or ministerial position. <laughs> of course, it serves those roles, but it is a very hands-on position. And so we are, you know, we have our, our fingers on the dial of, of the course of climate change action globally as set by the biggest cities in the world. And what I think we really are doing are setting bars, not floors, and charting new areas of work in clean construction, in consumption-based emissions, in you know, clean buildings, in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate impacts from our food systems, everything you can imagine. And one of the really important things that um, Mayor Garcetti came forward is his key platform when he uh, came in as chair at the beginning of this year was this notion of pursuing a global Green New Deal. And that the key principles there are founded very similarly on, on what LA's Green New Deal is founded on, which really is that urgency, that importance of focusing and prioritizing equity and justice, and that we are building an inclusive, prosperous economy. Uh, so that means building coalitions of, of cities, 
cities even beyond the C40 network of uh, youth and really empowering youth voices of businesses that are leaders and where we can push even harder. And of course, in the um, in our uh, labor sectors as well, where we want workers to feel empowered to participate in in essentially what's going to become their future. So this real coalition building what became kind of the the platform at the start of the year when the mayor declared the 2020s, the decade of action, as we started 2020. And then in March, uh, when the coronavirus was really taking hold across the world, um, Mayor Garcetti called upon his C40 colleagues. And within two days, we were on a Zoom call back when Zoom was um, novel. Um, with about 60 mayors from around the world. So every time zone, people were up early, up late, all to be a part of this and really talk to each other about what's going on in their communities and what to watch out for and how to support each other. But it was really because of climate change that this, these relationships are being built. Um, and what came out of that was the establishment of the Global Mayors uh, COVID-19 Recovery Task Force. And you can also check that out on the C40 website, but has become really the leading voice on what a green and just recovery must look like. And that any stimulus across any country, any jurisdiction must be a green stimulus. That this is a once in a generation moment where, where um, dollars, where currencies are being infused into economies, will be infused into economies at rates not seen in a generation or more um, and in a century or more. And, and we must make sure that climate change and a clean energy economy and clean, clean growth are at the center and the heart of that. Um, and that's really the, the platform that we've laid through C40 and that we're bringing to the international negotiations, we're bringing to all of our national governments. And that's really the, the power of when cities are collaborating um, to, to make, change that far exceeds the the jurisdiction or the you know capacity of any one city in any one in any one country and so with that i think i will close thanks and open up to questions thanks very much lauren that was uh, fantastic i think i'm going to give you and your boss the yoda uh, do or not do there there is no try word for this year it almost seemed like you got you just got to that uh that point, and that's why you acted much more uh, decisively. Um, so I want to start with a series of questions. I think we're up to 35 questions, and about a third of them are on. Uh, it, it, this, these will probably be familiar, but I think it's important to get your uh, way of thinking about such things. Won't this cost a lot of money? Where's the money going to come from? Don't you have restricted budgets at the state level, COVID going on, and so on? I, I'm sure you. Uh, Think about these each and every day. So, how would you respond to people who say either it will cost too much, uh, it will be unfair to local businesses where they are uh, shut down even more than uh, COVID? Uh, it'll be unfair to them. It sounds sounds like you spent a lot of time building up a broad coalition of stakeholders. So, as an outsider, that would be one guess. But how would you respond to that type those types of questions? It's a really important question and it's totally fair. And I would say that even before COVID-19, you know, when we released this plan and we began our, you know, our implementation planning and thinking, that was already, you know, part of the discussion is how are we, you know, making sure that, that policies are not regressive, that policies are not overly burdensome. And there's a couple of different things. One, so much of the of the action has to do with really eliminating inefficiencies. And so what's what's often lost is the cost savings that come with, you know, if we're talking taking building decarbonization, for example, um, building decarbonization, you know, on the face of it, some folks think really expensive, retrofits are very expensive, you know, there's high upfront costs. But actually, we need to be taking and, and we're looking to take a much more holistic approach where if you're looking at deep energy efficiency retrofits and deep energy efficiency savings, and we're able to buy down the cost through things like rebates through our utility or bringing in um, other programs that can be um, 
underwritten by private finance, you can get rid of some of those upfront costs and really just pay back investments through savings. So one of the things that we really have focused on is private finance. Understanding that, you know, as some of the questions are suggesting, these solutions do not have to be on the backs of, of taxpayers, of residents alone, that there is a lot of return to be made on investment. And therefore it is, it is an absolute imperative that we bring in the private finance sectors into all of this work. We're doing that in a few different places. We're certainly looking at that in building decarbonization. There's a, a ton of interest where we could be you know, leveraging a, a green bond or putting forward a, um, an accelerator where we can help aggregate buildings to uh, improve pricing and improve in, you know, access to finance that then buys down those costs while we're also offering rebates for that type of equipment. When it comes to, you know, for example, the uh, transition of heavy duty trucks at the port. One of the things we just did uh, last month was issue an RFI, a request for information after putting together a large finance forum, a clean truck finance forum to say, we really think that the private sector um, would want to be a part of this effort. And there are folks who are in the business of managing assets like clean fleets, clean vehicle fleets, who should be able to pay for this. Um, and then you know, work with drivers, work with companies to lease out those, those fleets at a cost that's competitive with their, you know, diesel conventional alternatives and you'd be able to monetize other other value streams that are created through our policies or state policies like the low carbon fuel standard or other types of policies and incentive monies that are available through state and local agencies. And they all agree. So we're expecting significant feedback and responses in January when the RFI closes for how actually we could create a much more um, public-private partnership oriented system, such that it's not just on the back of, you know, charging, charging a fee and then figuring out how many trucks can you buy with, you know, however much we can collect from, from a fee, that we can really vastly expand that. And then finally, I'll just say one other thing is that we absolutely need federal help, um, especially right now. The mayor has, has not minced words that states and cities need to be bailed out that we are in a situation where it is destructive not to think about how the federal government needs to be supporting the recovery of states and cities um, as, a, as part of the coronavirus recovery plan, because we are able to more directly provide services and tailor services to the needs of our local businesses um, and our local residents. And so absolutely, it is going to be a compilation of different methods so that this is not regressive to the overall economy. So going, uh, going back to the um, holistic approach, uh, we did have a number of questions regarding um, issues regarding the interactions between California and the federal government. Of course, this is changing daily. And I know your boss is, um, talks to uh, President-elect Biden. I promised I wouldn't say that, but I, I just did. Uh, so uh, are, are you optimistic uh, about that? Uh, do you care about that? So one question is, is it a big problem? Uh, maybe on the COVID side, but even in your space pre-COVID, is that a big problem? And uh, uh, if it is, uh, do you care? I, I know other California leaders said, of course it would be better to have the federal government in, but if they're not, we're gonna go double down anyway, which seems like the status quo ante at this point. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I would uh, agree with those very apt comments from previous speakers that that absolutely, um, regardless of who is in the White House, you know, the state of California or a city like Los Angeles, and a lot of our peer cities are determined to move very boldly on on climate policy and climate action and the development of a green economy. Um, of course, there are ways to create more and more wind at our back through federal partnership. Um, there's a lot that the federal government can do through funding sources, programs that are directed at state and cities through you know, energy efficiency or grid modernization. Of course, creating you know, the, the issues around um, the rollbacks for vehicle econ uh, fuel economy standards. You know, those make it 
maybe like another sort of weight on the process um, and our progress where of course, if there was a stronger signal nationally, maybe technology could move faster. But you know, a state like California can command a lot of, of market signal when it, it makes a, a, a pronouncement like even what Governor Newsom did a couple of, or a month ago with his executive order saying that you know all new vehicle sales must be zero emission by 2035. He also adopted the drayage truck commitment that we put in in, 2030, uh, in 2017. We put that goal in for our port. He adopted it for ports statewide of the zero emission drayage trucks by 2035, 100% of the fleet. So I would say yes and yes. I think a lot can happen faster with a federal partner but it's not that we then are gonna sort of step back and say, Phew, all right, you take it from here, you know, President Biden, um, it's, it's really gonna be full steam ahead no matter what. Uh, def definitely a Jedi mentality, if I could say such a thing. So on this, uh, you've talked a lot about collaborations, coordinations and so on. So a lot of people wanna know, who are you collaborating with? And I will point out in previous talks this quarter, we've had, uh, Janaea Scott from the Energy Commission, Kathy Zoy, who I know you says she knows you well, uh, who's now down running EVgo in LA. And last Wednesday, we had a special seminar with Henry Levins. Do you talk to those kind of people? Who else do you talk to? Who do you like? Who, who's been a good partner from your point of view? Uh, yeah, all, I mean, all of them. So, I mean, of course, the state, you know, Janaea and her, her uh, colleagues at the commission, at the California Energy Commission, are wonderful and looking to understand, you know, what are the needs, you know, Janae's focus is on transportation um, and they do, a, a, you know, they offer a lot of um, incentives for the development of vehicles or infrastructure, um, electric vehicles or electric infrastructure, particularly on the medium and heavy duty side. And so as we put together specific projects and specific initiatives, you know, being able to compete for funding at the CEC, having them understand what our priorities are as they develop uh, their priorities, very important coordination and, and information sharing. EVgo, you know, when they knew that we were putting out this RFI for a port program, you know, they're very excited to be able to figure out how can they partner with other providers um, in this space so that they can be the provider of choice for EV infrastructure, for heavy duty EV infrastructure at the port. And of course, I mean, we want to see as much competition and we want to see the right people, you know, putting the infrastructure in the ground and running these programs. And RMI, um, you know, is an incredibly important analytical partner to us uh, through a number of programs through the American Cities Climate Challenge, which is the Bloomberg Philanthropies Program, working with 25 of the largest cities in America to accelerate our work on transportation emission reductions and, and buildings emission reductions. And so RMI has been a, a thought leader and an and a, um, analytical partner in many, many ways. And they're, they're leaders across the renewable energy space and the building space um, and so on. But also other cities, like I said, I mean, really working with our, our counterparts across uh, the state, but, but even more so glo you know, globally, nationally, um, I mentioned the buildings accelerator concept. We are looking at what New York City is doing there, you know, on congestion pricing. You know, we're comparing notes with the city of Seattle on their work when it comes to um, clean construction and embedded emissions in our construction materials and building materials. You know, there's there's cities like Oslo um, that are doing amazing things that we're learning from as well. Our our work on mobility and zero emission zones in the city. We're taking a lot of learnings from the city of London. There's so much we can pull from. Um, major innovative energy projects out of, out of Orlando, Florida, or Cincinnati. Um, really incredible work that our strong networks ensure that you know, we can pull from. And, and uh, Mayor Garcetti likes to say, good mayors borrow, great mayors steal. And so it's it's really important that we are stealing from as many sources as we can. So he does have the Yoda genes, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, so one last question uh, we did. The very first question um, that you got was, uh, we're now up to uh, 44 questions. 
is uh, I've heard about the LA uh, Council uh, Youth Council for Climate Action. What's yeah. up with that? Can I broaden that a bit and say I, I know there are many students um, on the line now, and you'll talk to some of them up at close and personal at the top of the hour, who would really like to to be you uh, when they get to be your age, which isn't very old compared to me. Uh, what advice would you give them? So uh, what's the deal with the LA Youth Council for Climate Action? And what advice would you give young people who want to be doing work like you're doing with the kind of objectives you have at this point? So LA's Youth Council for Climate Action is um, really, I think, one of the first of its kind. And it was a recognition by the mayor last year that you know, young people, when it comes to climate change, are not just the leaders of tomorrow, but they really are, have become, have stepped into a role of the leaders of today. And that it is no longer something that we can say, you know, yeah, 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 like come to us when you're a voter or something like that, right? That these these are really compelling and important messages. And, and my, my, my little young one is making noises right now. Um, but that these are extraordinarily important messages and um, credible messengers about what we are, what kind of games are we playing with our future? Um, that they can be messengers to older generations, that they can be messengers to elected officials about reminding us of what the art of the possible is when we're unrestricted by other forces. And the mayor's really taken that to heart. And so it's uh, about a, a 15 person usually, uh, we're in our second year, um, uh, council of, of ages 15 to 21. And so a lot of people in um, high school and a few in college try to get a little bit of a mix and a good mix of representation around the entire city, all regions of the city, really coming together. And we both use the opportunities in our monthly meetings and in additional kind of offsites, if you will, which is a little different in the Zoom Zoomosphere. Um, to do to do learnings and development and professional development, but also for them to start to develop with themselves what their priority topics and actions and accomplishments that they want over the course of that year. So that come, that has included in the past advocacy at LAUSD for certain types of actions, um, developing kind of a student handbook and case studies around what you can do for leading climate action as a student in your community or in your schools, and also helping underscore and push actions that we're trying to take in the city. Um, and so that's what uh, the last year was focused on, and, and we've only just had two meetings of this year, so we're, we're going to see really how that plays out. In terms of your future, I would say, first, follow what you're passionate about and, and feel free to dabble and test. Um, you know, the use of, of internships or Stanford programs, Stanford funding to go out and do things over the summers, um, take unpaid internships because you can get funding or travel, really use your time, particularly as a student, to test out things. If you have a bad experience, great, cross it off the list and move on. Uh, but, but do think about exposing yourself to different types of opportunities, different sectors, and follow what you're passionate about. Because that will lead you, you will stand out when you are passionate about a topic or passionate about an area that you're working on. Certainly stay in touch with mentors like John and like others that you are working with at Stanford or in other places, you're you know, an old boss at an internship or a previous job please stay in touch and develop those professional networks because they are so important to coming back to and offering advice and perspective, providing recommendations and just broadening that network. And so I would, I would also say that every role I've had would have been a completely unforeseen role when I started the previous role. <laughs> so the job I had before this, I would have never in a million years thought my next job would be working in local government in the city of Los Angeles and so on and so on back from there. And so in some ways, don't overpressure yourself, but just stay open to opportunities. Be, be vigilant about meeting people that interest you and that you know, um, companies or organizations that you admire. Um, I would stay you know, well-read and well-informed in those respects. And, and you know, try to just not close yourself off to opportunity because 
often they move into spheres that you would have never have expected. And I can certainly say that that's, that's I think how I got to where I am. And I, for me, I think it's an incredibly rewarding and right place for me right now, but I cannot ever say I would have expected it. So uh, quite appropriately, I just got a note from Ralph Cavana who said, NRBC <laughs> is proud to have been the source of an early internship for Lauren. Uh, so with, with Thanks those- Thanks to a Stanford program, no less. Hi, Ralph. <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, Lauren, that uh, was fabulous with those words of wisdoms at the end uh, in particular. So I'd like to thank you for an inspirational seminar and we wish you well and anything we can do to help just let us uh, no, and uh, we'd like to be able to uh, welcome you here to the Stanford campus before too long, but uh, I think uh, smart COVID programs combined with smart uh, Green New Deal programs might enable that, so go to it. Thanks a lot. Agreed. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>